Welcome to Evaluate's February webinar, High Impact, Low Cost Evaluation for Small Projects. I'm Lori Wingate, and with me here today is Jason Burkhart, who will be moderating the remainder of this webinar. Also joining us today are Elaine Kraft and Dennis Faber from MentorConnect, the nation's premier destination for information related to professional development for technician and related STEM educators. We'd also like to acknowledge the behind-the-scenes contributions of Mike Lasecki and Janet Pinhorn at Maytech Networks, Charlotte Forrest at MentorConnect, and Emma Perk here at Evaluate. This webinar has been designed for individuals involved in or interested in NSF's ATE program. For those of you who are not familiar with that program, ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. And of course, NSF is how we refer to the National Science Foundation. Elaine will tell you more about the focus of the ATE program in a little bit. The slides and handout from today's webinar are available on our website. The webinar is being recorded and will email you the link for the recording when it's available, which commonly takes two or three days. Our presenters will be talking about ATE Small Grants, Mentor Connect, Maximizing Evaluation Impact, and Minimizing Evaluation Costs. Please remember, you may type your questions or comments in the chat box at any time and we'll go over them during the question break. Please note, if you're watching a recording of this webinar, you will not see the chat box as part of the recording. And now I'd like to turn things over to Elaine Kraft, who will talk about ATE Small Projects. Thanks, Elaine. ATE, however, has, very specific, has a very specific focus within the broader set of STEM disciplines. ATE is all about technician education. ATE is primarily interested in the advanced technology programs offered by two-year technical and community colleges in this country. Secondary teachers and programs that encourage high school students to pursue and prepare them for success in technician education programs at the post-secondary level are also important to ATE. Academic pathways for students to pursue advanced study are also encouraged, but upper division college programs are not a focus of ATE. Within the ATE program, there are three distinct funding tracks, centers, projects, and targeted research. We will talk about the Centers Track first. Within the ATE Centers Track are three types of centers for which funding is available. There are National Centers, Regional Centers, and Support Centers. <clears throat> it is helpful to think of centers as what a select number of ATE projects grow up to be. Support Centers very frequently represent an advanced outreach phase of a previously funded national center. Regional centers typically focus on building capacity in a designated region in a specific discipline, such as biotechnology, cybersecurity, or manufacturing technology, to meet a well-defined industry need. National centers take a national leadership role in the advancement of technician education in a specific discipline and often coordinate a large national network of partners. One additional item of interest about centers is that funding, um, this funding track offers a planning grant opportunity. You may seek funding for planning an ATE center. This allows very important legwork to be completed prior to launching these large efforts should an award be made. Now, let's look at the targeted research track. Sex successful research projects are most likely to be well-defined collaborations between accomplished educational researchers and technician educators. The focus is on exploring what works and what doesn't in technician education, for whom, and under what conditions. Those pursuing targeted research may begin with a smaller research planning grant and progress up to a full-scale research project. The last major funding uh, track is projects. Boy, one look at this diagram and you see that within the projects funding track, there are numerous funding opportunities. 
Let's see if we can make some sense of this. The largest number of ATE awards made each year are in the projects category. Projects can address a very broad spectrum of topics related to technician education, and there are special subcategories of funding that fall under the project's umbrella. Three specific subcategories are depicted. ATE coordination networks, which is a new opportunity that was introduced in 2014, conferences and workshops, and small grants for institutions new to ATE. Today, we want to draw your attention specifically to the small grants for institutions new to ATE. The small grants opportunity is designed to attract more and new two-year colleges and principal investigators to the ATE program. Eligible colleges have not had NSF funding ever, or at least not in the last 10 years. These grant proposals can request a total of $200,000 for a two or three year grant project. Up to 20 awards are made in this category each year. One important fact to understand is that small grant proposals only compete against other small grant proposals and are not reviewed with the larger pool of project proposals. Next, we will explore your chances of being funded. It is helpful to know that funding rates are impacted by three major factors. The first is the overall funding level for the program. In other words, how much money do they have to make awards? Second, the number of proposals submitted. Obviously, the more proposals received, the greater the competition and the lower the funding rate. And last, the quality of the proposals. The NSF merit review process, which is considered a gold standard across federal um, grant making agencies, ensures that only quality proposals are funded. There's no congressional mandate that a certain amount of money be awarded in any given year um, or for any particular solicitation. So they fund only quality proposals. Now, let's see how much you know about funding rates in ATE. We're going to do another poll. In this first poll, I'll ask you to use your polling buttons again. Um, you see the little A in the box on the left of your screen, and you will choose which of the answers you think is correct. What percentage of all ATE proposals do you think were funded last year? Okay, we'll give you another minute or two to find your polling button and make your guess. Okay, Mike, I believe you're going to show us uh, how our audience has responded. Well, it appears that most of you think the funding rate in the ATE program overall is about 20%. We'll find out in a few minutes whether you're right or you're wrong. Let's take one more look at another poll and drill down a little further. Within the ATE program is this opportunity for small grants to institutions new to ATE. What do you think the funding rate is for this particular subset of our project's funding track? Again, use your polling buttons on the left to select the rate that you believe to be most accurate. Okay, get those votes in. All right, Mike, thank you. Uh, so apparently most of you think that the uh, rate's about 45%. Now, as promised, we will see the answers. Most of you were dead on. The ATE proposals overall last year were funded at about 20% rate. But the funding rate for the small grants is even greater than most of you thought. It's, it was about 65% last year and typically ranges from about 60 to 70% in any given year.
obviously you will want to increase the odds that your grant proposal will be funded. So if you are eligible for the small grants category, this is definitely the place to start. The funding rate is better, your competition is limited to other small grant proposals, and there is special help available for those new to ATE. You will hear more about this special help shortly when Dennis Faber shall, shares information about MentorConnect, a project funded by NSF ATE. You may be wondering what you can do with a small grant. Let's look at three examples. All of these colleges have worked with MentorConnect and are now ATE grantees. Let's start with my friends over at Chattanooga State Community College. They are addressing a pressing industry need in their area for more welding and non-destructive testing technicians. Building on strong programs at the college and an established partnership with WeldEd, a national ATE center for welding education and training, they are reaching out to area high schools and community colleges to strengthen faculty skills in welding and non-destructive testing. The project includes a faculty development workshop with year-long follow-up. This faculty training will enable teachers to acquire the credentials necessary to offer dual credit introductory courses in welding and non-destructive testing. Students can then apply the dual credit from these courses towards an associate degree at the college. The next example is Northwest Connecticut Community College. They are addressing a well-defined industry need in their area for advanced manufacturing technicians. By adapting and implementing curriculum developed by the ATE Regional Center for Next Generation Manufacturing, which is based in Connecticut, and incorporating best practices and piggybacking on articulation agreements developed by the Regional ATE Center, a new associate degree program in advanced manufacturing will be initiated in this rural area that would not otherwise have been possible. And last, let's look at the example of St. Paul College in Minnesota. They are located in a hotbed of nanotechnology, chemical, and other research and instrumentation companies. To address the documented and growing need of their employers for more highly skilled technicians in chemical technology and science instrumentation who already have clean room experience, the college is growing its science instrumentation technician program to enroll at least 24 students per semester who will benefit from four credit problem-based internships with mentor guidance from industry professionals. So you see the variety is great, but these um, examples show in each case a well-defined industry need. They're preparing technicians for the workforce, and they all align very well with the NSF ATE mission. As I mentioned earlier, some projects grow up to be centers. A small grant starts this progression in motion. Small grants should be considered a first step in achieving a larger vision for technician education in your region. If you do a good job with a small project that focuses primarily on your college and local academic and industry partners, then you will be well positioned to expand your network, add new partnerships, and tackle a full-scale project. The progression below is a good example of the way that some grantees grow their programs and work to achieve a larger vision. The South Carolina AT Center, where I serve as Principal Investigator and Director, is an example of this progression. It all started years ago with a project and a planning grant. Then we received national center funding. Years later, we transitioned to other types of funding and now we provide a, provi a variety of support services for technician educators nationally. Now I will provide you with a few tips for getting started. Start small. Rome wasn't built in a day. Use the valuable resources developed by other ATE centers and projects. This is a community that loves to share. Consult with ATE principal investigators who work, whose work aligns with your interests and local needs. Pay close attention to the goals of NSF and the ATE program in particular. Don't stray from the core purpose of ATE. And incorporate areas of ATE emphasis if you can, 
such as addressing the challenges that rural areas face in technician education. To find resources developed by others, the ATE Central website is a great starting point. ATE Central is the Grand Central Station of ATE, where all roads from there lead to ATE centers and projects and their repositories of resources. ATE Central provides a number of resources that ATE grantees and potential grantees find useful. To get help with proposal development, grant funding, and project implementation, you can contact MentorConnect. And now I will turn the program over to my co-PI, Dennis Faber, to tell you why MentorConnect is a good idea and how this project can help you. Dennis? Thanks, Elaine, and welcome all. Uh, as Elaine mentioned, I'm the co-PI for the MentorConnect project. And like many of the other folks involved with the MentorConnect project, uh, have uh, extensive years of working with various NSF projects and centers. I've served as a PI and director, uh, served on various review panels, and also been involved in a variety of mentoring projects. The Mentor Connect program is a very successful NSF project that serves the entire ATE community. We are in the third year of funding, and like many of you, uh, we're going through the review process for an additional cycle of funding. Uh, the Mentor Connect project addresses a well-recognized need for technical assistance and mentoring support to help ensure the success of ATE projects and centers. And one of the other benefits that we think is accruing to those who participate with Mentor Connect <clears throat> is the development of that next generation of ATE leaders, which is very important as NSF begins to uh, move into its next generation of activity. The Mentor Connect program provides two levels of support for potential and current grantees. The first three items on this slide describe the support for those community colleges new to the ATE program. We provide funding for an annual cohort of 20 community college teams to receive assistance to develop, refine, and eventually submit their funding proposal. There are various worksheets and proposal development resources that guide them through the process. They receive direct one-to-one -one mentoring assistance from an experienced PI uh, who's usually also been the director of a project at some point along the way. There are two workshops that they, are, that they participate in with mentors and Mentor Connect staff to hone their proposals and address any barriers that they may be experiencing. The remaining items are available to annual cohort members and also to any ATE community member seeking funding on their own, as well as those who may already have received funding and are looking at ways to improve their success. There are three webinars, one on right-sizing evaluation. That's the one in which you're currently participating. Uh, completing all the required forms accurately. And the third one is in building an acceptable budget and budget justification for your proposal. These webinars have received uh, strong applause from participants in the past, and we encourage you to think about joining with us as they unfold over the next several months. There is an increasingly extensive online uh, Mentor Connect resource pool that's available to any member of the AT community. And we have a help desk support to address specific questions directly or by referral to our ATE colleagues as needed. Applying to Mentor Connect is a fairly simple process. There are a couple of steps to that process. We first ask you to pull together a team 
that will participate in MetaConnect if accepted. That includes two STEM or technician education faculty members plus your grant writer. We will expect you to develop a one-page concept paper for the work you'd like to do. We'd also like you to make sure you have administrative commitment for your involvement. And all of those things are part of the application process. Those applications are available uh, this summer. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the application process, you can visit mentorconnect.org and learn a little bit more about those requirements. These are the team members that have helped make Mentor Connect the success that it is so far. Uh, in the back row, left to right, you've met me and Elaine so far. Osa Brand is the PI for the ATE IGET project on integrated geospatial and remote sensing education. She's also one of our valued mentors. Marjorie Rijanaki is a consultant who's helped us on a variety of project activities. And again, valued experience in the AT community as well. On the front row left to right, Ellen House is co-PI for Mentor Connect and also director of the American Association of Community College Program, MentorLinks. That's another mentoring process supported by NSF and AACC. Um, and it addresses a little bit different target than the Mentor Connect program. Ellen also plans and implements the annual ATEPI conference, and that's been a resounding success for the last 20 plus years. Charlotte Forrest is our Mentor Connect project manager and key person of contact for all of our efforts. It's likely if you have questions for us, you'll probably touch bases with Charlotte as a starting point. The final staff member is Sandy Mikulowski. She has been a consultant in various project activities as well, and again, long and rich experience in the ATE program. So I'll turn it over to uh, Jason to field some questions and answers. Thank you. OK. Thanks a lot, Elaine and Dennis. Uh, so this brings us to our first Q&A break. If you have any questions, please uh, type them in the chat box now. We did have one question from Max Imus. Uh, and the question is, uh, I have a colleague at a private school that I won't name. Are they eligible to submit a grant proposal? And I'll direct that to you, Elaine. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I know in the Mentor Connect project, we only um, have served publicly funded um, two-year technical and community colleges and some four-year institutions that offer associate degree programs. Um, again, the ATE focuses on technician education. Um, but I actually don't know uh, what the funding eligibility is for private institutions in the uh, NSF and ATE program. Okay. Um, Dennis, did you have uh, any insight into that? I would suspect that the answer is yes, as long as the, the the focus for whatever it is that they're proposing is clearly on technician education. Okay, thanks. Uh, so this question is for Elaine. Uh, how does NSF define new to the ATE program? Um, it would be any institution that has not had funding from the NSF ATE program specifically uh, ever or has not had that funding in the last 10 years. Um, it is okay if you have, if your institution has been funded by another program at NSF, such as their STEM scholarship program, for instance. Um, that does not um, negate your newness to the ATE program. Um, so that's that's one of the, the criteria is um, is never having had funding and uh, or not having had funding in the last 10 years. Jason, this is Dennis. I'd like to add a little something to that. Sometimes in multi-campus settings, 
Uh, one campus may have received ATE funding, and that does not disqualify other campuses from receiving that funding. Okay, Dennis great. is right yep. about that. Um, the defining thing there is whether or not the campus has its own chief academic officer. So if, if you have a branch campus that has its own chief academic officer, uh, then that campus would be eligible separate from a different campus of that same uh, organization. Okay, excellent. And one final question before we move on. Do the mentees have to pay a fee for Mentor Connect services? And I'll take a shot at that, Jason. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, this is a project funded by the NSF ATE project. And other than the time that they may invest in either preparing a proposal or chasing down some answers to questions, there are no particular fees for the services that Mentor Connect provides. OK, great. So I'll keep track of the remaining questions. Uh, we'll move on now, and then we'll pick those up uh, towards the end of the webinar. But before we move on to the next section, it's time for a commercial break. So hi, folks. Have you ever found yourself wanting a way to get great content while connecting with others in the ATE program? Well, we have the solution for you. Reading our social media feeds is a great way to spend time on a quiet Sunday afternoon, and you can even share it with your ATE friends and family. Be the first to know about upcoming events on Facebook and Twitter. Find out about the resources we use every day on our Pinterest page, and get to know the community through our LinkedIn group. Plus, our blog slices and dices important content generated by users from around the AT community. Bonus, it never gets dull. Lori Wingate wrote this week's blog post, which lines up with our webinar content today. Plus, you can now subscribe to the blog to get the latest updates whenever a new article is published. The website is free to use, so it's perfect for small ATE grants. So come on down today. We'll see you there. Now back to our regularly scheduled program, where Lori will tell us how to maximize evaluation impact on a shoestring. Well, thank you, Jason, and thank you to Dennis and Elaine as well. Um, while you guys were chatting, I did look up that question about eligibility to apply. For NSF grants in general, private um, schools as well as, as for-profit organizations are eligible to apply. Of course, you want to look at the ATE solicitation to see if there's specific requirements for that program. Um, but in general, they are eligible. Um, in this section of the webinar, I am going to focus on steps you can take to make sure your evaluation is valuable and useful. And I'm going to be probably directing most of my comments when I say you to the PI role or the project staff role. Um, but it, this, when I say you, I'm really talking about a team working on a project and the evaluation collectively. First, um, what does it mean? to you? What, is it, what does a high impact evaluation mean to you? When I think of an evaluation that's high impact, I think of one that really makes a difference to a project, in a good way, of course. Um, so I'm curious what this means to you, and if you just want to use the chat box, as I know you all know how to do now, and, and share your ideas about that, that would be great. High impact. We all want a high impact evaluation, right, and a high impact project. Gordon says one that's formative, so one that we're using along the way to make improvements. Great. Max Imus is saying one that's going to help him support the, his claims about outcomes. Beth is also hitting on the point about evaluation that's going to be useful to help planning and, and improving a project. Feedback. Okay, those are great suggestions. They're great ideas. Keep them coming. Um, and and they point to some, I think, some ideas we're going to touch on today. You know, an impactful evaluation is one that's going to be useful, that gives you information you can use to improve your projects, and as Max pointed out, to convince others of the project's value and quality. Um, all right, I skipped ahead a little bit, but okay, so my second question is, what, what makes evaluation costly? You're here today because you're interested, I assume, in keeping evaluation costs low. So where are those resources going? What sucks up the, the evaluation budget disproportionately, if anything? Okay. Ken is saying case study interviews. So yeah, the time it takes to do qualitative research for sure. Uh, the evaluator 
him or herself, as Beth is pointing out, hiring, paying that evaluator, absolutely, material, external evaluator. Ken is saying poorly organized data and lack of a plan. Well, excellent point. Um, yeah, the data collection is expensive and, and uh, people's time. That's probably the biggest thing. It's, it costs a lot of money. Um, so it's important for projects to use the evaluator's time as efficiently as and effectively as possible. And we're going to touch on a lot of, of things you can do to, to help that. Um, first, before we get into to those ideas, I want to make sure we're all clear on what evaluation really involves. So it, it's a complex process, right? Um, and there's lots of people will depict it in lots of different ways. But for me, it really boils down to four main steps or components. Um, first, we're going to ask important questions about a project's processes and outcomes. And this is really about focusing the evaluation. When it comes to getting an efficient evaluation, when we're using your resources wisely, this is really critical. You want to make sure you're focusing on the things that really matter. Next, we gather evidence that will help us answer those questions. And Elaine Kraft, who's on the webinar with us, as you know, she once told me about uh, what she called a data-free evaluation that she'd seen. You definitely do not want one of those. So then we have to make sense of those data. So we interpret the results and answer those evaluation questions. And then the last step is to use the information for accountability, improvement, and planning. But it's not really a final step because the evaluation should feed into planning the next project and that evaluation. So which of these steps should we skip to save money? OK, that's actually a trick question. Don't answer it. Um, you really can't skip any of these steps. When, we, when you see a low quality evaluation, uh, an unimpactful evaluation, it's going to be probably because one or more of these things is missing. For example, you might see a lot of data in an evaluation. But if those results aren't situated in terms of the questions being answered or the overall conclusions, um, or if the evidence was weak so it wasn't useful for either answering the questions or using the results, that's not an impactful evaluation. So what are we going to do? We can't skip any of these steps. Do we call in the magical evaluation fairy, the, the one who's going to give us a great evaluation for nothing? Ooh, I hope I hate to disappoint you. Um, there are definitely some very bright and generous evaluators in the ATE program. Um, a lot of really helpful people. And they may seem like fairy godmothers or fathers because they're willing to do more than they're paid for. But you really can't count on that. So here are some things you can do to get the most bang for your evaluation buck. You want to make sure that the scope of the evaluation matches the scope of the project. You want to keep good records and develop a tracking system to monitor project reach and participation, as well as document project activities and accomplishments. Use institutional data as much as possible and relevant. And finally, leverage internal and external evaluation responsibilities to answer those important evaluation questions. In other words, don't just rely on your external evaluation consultant to do all the work. But this is by far the most important point. You really don't want to waste your resources on collecting and analyzing data that are not relevant to your project's purposes or your information needs, which some of you mentioned there in the chat box. Before you even get to this first step and begin planning the overall evaluation, you have to make sure that everyone's crystal clear on what the project is all about especially the needs that the project is addressing, its main activities, its impactees, and its intended outcomes. So I want to go through the, a little exercise altogether where we do this for a real project. I searched the NSF awards database for a completed ATE project that received $200,000 or less in funding, which is the, the max for an ATE small grant. So I found this one, and I thought it was a pretty nice example for our purposes today. So this is pretty, almost the entire abstract that I got from the awards database. So I'm going to give you about a minute to read through it. And we're going to be working through this abstract for the next um, few minutes. So, and I'm going to ask you a series of questions about it, and you'll type your answers in the chat box. So please do read it carefully. And I'm going to give you one minute, which should be plenty of time to read it.
Okay, so that was about a minute. First question. Based on your reading of this abstract, what is the problem or need being addressed by this project? And I will ask you to use the chat box to give your response. So we're seeing people honing in on faculty knowledge, faculty capacity. Peggy hit it exactly. Faculty not prepared to deal with open lab format perfectly. Yep, it's pretty clearly stated. The faculty member on hand at any one time might not have the expertise needed to help the students. So apparently the students are having trouble using the lab because of they don't have all the information they need, and then the faculty don't have the information they need to give them the guidance. Um, and there's a clue down here as well that there must be a lot of students who aren't successful in their first attempts at the courses that require lab work. So let's be clear, the, the problem isn't necessarily um, faculty, I mean, the, the way we're solving the problem is faculty skills, but the problem itself is that students aren't getting the help that they need uh, in the labs. Next, what are the main project activities? Again, just use your chat box to identify the main project activity in this abstract. Can I identify it? Train faculty, cross-train faculty. Yeah, perfect. Again, it's very clearly stated here that the project is going to provide cross-training for the faculty staffing the lab. It also says support and enhancement, as some of you may have noticed, but it's not quite clear to me what that means. And that's probably something I'm sure they explain in their full proposal, but we only have what we see here. So I'm going to focus on the training part. But if I were the evaluator for this project, I definitely want to know what was entailed by those support and enhancement activities. So we know the main activity. Now we need to be clear on who the main participants in that activity are. So who is that? That's going to be really easy for you. Faculty. Yep. Again, it's the faculty staff in the labs. So what's supposed to be different for the faculty because of this project? Lori says better skilled. Ken says more knowledge, more knowledge, basic concepts. Teresa said it exactly. They'll have the knowledge to answer the students' questions. Perfect. And I'll highlight that right here. It all boils down to getting those participating faculty to a point where they can provide adequate support to all students involved in the courses that need to use those labs. So just two more key questions, which are also regarding outcomes. Let's be clear who is ultimately supposed to benefit from this project. Students, 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 students. You guys got that 100%. Of course, it's the students. It should always come down to students or workers. When we think of those larger ATE program goals, what ATE is all about, this project isn't about the program, and this project as well isn't about training faculty for faculty's sake. It's about the students. A last question. What is supposed to be different for those students because of the project? Eric says pass on first attempt. Yep. I'm going to pass that class. Better completion, better education. Right. Right. Let's highlight that here. Um, they're going to learn more. They're going to get more out of that class. They're going to achieve at a higher level. And the college wants to see more students successfully completing these courses the first time, which has all kinds of benefits, as we know. Um, now, I realize these were not tough questions for, for many of you, but the answers to these kinds of questions aren't always obvious for projects. Good ideas aren't always well articulated. I'm sure you all have seen proposals of the kind that are, are less clear than this one. And sometimes it can take a lot of back and forth between an evaluator and a project team to get these questions answered in concrete terms, where it's really at, you can really create an actionable evaluation plan. But once you have the answers, you can get down to planning the details of an evaluation. You will waste a lot of resources if you don't get clarity on these issues before starting the evaluation plan. And that's why we're going through this exercise in this webinar, which is about keeping costs down. So I do have an extra credit question. One really important part of this abstract is not highlighted. So we would like you to use your marker this time and just circle that area you think maybe should have maybe gotten some attention or it's curious that it didn't get attention.
Yeah, a lot of you are honing right in that, that goal number two. That's a goal for heaven's sake. Why, why are we not talking about that goal? Uh, it seems pretty important. Yet I didn't highlight it, and I didn't highlight it because it didn't answer any of our questions. Um, we talked about you know, what the need is, what the activity is, who's going to be impacted, affected, what the outcomes are. And we didn't so much, that didn't really help us answer any of those questions. So in this case, as an evaluator, I would question the project team and try to get them to really pin down what it means to them to provide, to improve the quality of the lab. Is it something different than that was, what was already stated in goal one? Um, and if it, if it is, how is it different? And, and also, I would want to know what specific activities are supporting that goal. So what I've demonstrated here is background work you would need to do for a needs-based evaluation. Now if you're doing a goal-based evaluation where you're just checking to see if goals are met, you would start with the goals and work that way. So as you can see in this slide, um, what I've done is plugged in those answers into a very simple logic model-like presentation. So regarding the need, we know faculty don't have adequate knowledge to assist students, and because of that, a significant number of them are not performing well in these courses. And to address this problem, uh, this project is going to provide training to the faculty, and that is expected to lead to three levels of outcome related to faculty ability, student learning, and successful course completion. And as a side note, I think I just want to point out how important it is to distinguish outputs, which are the things a project creates, creates or produces, the tangible things, from outcomes, which is the difference it makes in relation to the problem it's trying to address. I've seen far too many logic models that have a list of outputs for their outcomes. And that relates to the issue of starting with goals to plan an evaluation. Because a lot of times you'll see goals like provide professional development or develop curriculum, something like that, which really doesn't get at the so what difference did you make kind of issue, which I'm trying to uh, underscore here. So this exercise worked out pretty well for this project. Um, the need, the activities, and the outcomes are logically linked. But sometimes when you do this for a project, it can really reveal gaps or big leaps in the project logic, project's logic. And when that happens, it's time to revisit the project design or its goals. But this one worked out pretty well. Now, we should be able to dive right into step one and figure out what the evaluation questions are for this project now that we've really hammered out the details and it's, it seems like it's uh, got a good logic to it. Since we established that the need and outcomes are well aligned, we won't worry about the need for right now. And it's always important to address both process and outcomes in a project evaluation. So let's look at the activities or the, the process here first. We could ask, to what extent did the training meet the needs of faculty? The training was oriented around filling a gap in faculty knowledge and skills, as many of you, uh, I think all of you realize. So it's pretty important that the evaluation check, that, check this. If, if it wasn't what the faculty needed, um, the project really doesn't have much chance of bringing about the intended outcomes. Next we can look at the first level of outcomes, asking to what extent did the training improve the faculty's competence with the lab equipment. Again, if we don't see results here, it's unlikely that we can, we'll, that there'll be a positive impact on students. Next, we can ask to what extent did the training improve student performance in lab-related courses? And that really gets at both of these outcomes. We'd want to pick that apart a little bit with our data, but it's really both levels. So now we have a nice set of three evaluation questions, and this is completely manageable for this evaluation. So we can move on to the next step which is to gather evidence. But of course, we're going to need a good plan for that. So in the interest of using our resources wisely, we need to make sure we collect data that are specifically relevant to the evaluation questions. And a good way to do that, to do that is to create a matrix like this one that matches up the evaluation questions with the indicators, which are the things we measure to allow us to answer the questions and the data sources or the methods we use for each indicator. So I'm not going into the details of this table in this webinar. You can view the slides later if you want the nitty gritty. What I want to impress upon you here is that it's so important to align evaluation questions with data and to make sure all the questions are answerable and that the data you're collecting feeds into those questions that you need to have answers. And also that you aren't collecting a bunch of data that isn't anything anybody really needs to know. And this is going to support efficiency in evaluation. 
So we've pretty much dealt with the first two steps here with regard to asking questions and gathering evidence. So let's consider interpretation. So one thing that can really simplify interpretation is setting targets for the indicators in advance. And I made up some targets for this project as you can see here. Saying that we're looking for 75% of the students to get a grade C or better on the lab assignments as well as for courses. On their, and, and to um, increase the, the, the successful completion rate to a baseline of 50% to 75%. In reality, you want to establish targets based on, on the current situation and be realistic. I, I don't know anything about the context of this actual project, so I just made these up. But you don't want to pull them out of thin air. Targets should be ambitious but attainable. And so for the interpretation piece, of the evaluation, we could compare the targets with our actual results in order to help us answer those overall questions. And you may find that the targets need to be adjusted once the data are in, and that's completely okay. And that brings us to the last step, using the information for accountability, improvement, and planning. Accountability is basically just demonstrating to NSF or any funder that you did what you said you would do with the grant money. Um, so you want to show your evaluation results here uh, in your NSF report to also show them what they got out of the investment. To use results for improving a project, you want to review the results as they're coming in to determine if changes are needed to implementation. For example, if the feedback from the faculty regarding the training is showing that there's some problems, those can be addressed right away. And it's never too early to start thinking about your next project. And you can use your evaluation results from a current project to determine what worked and didn't as you plan your next project. And if you do apply for another round of NSF funding, you'll need to summarize the evaluation um, results as well as lessons learned in the proposal's net, uh, results of prior support section, results of prior NSF support section, which you can, you off, they, in ATE, they want you to start off talking about that if you've had funding before. With regard to that, I just want to point out that having empirical data about your project and discussing what you learned from your evaluation really sh can show NSF and proposal reviewers that you're committed to excellence and that you are using your grant resources wisely. So we've covered all the main steps, and I hope you see how each piece really is essential and it wouldn't be wise to try to shave costs by omitting, omitting one of these components from an evaluation. And I just keep in mind, it's not the job of your small ATE project to take on the big ATE program goals all by itself. It's the project's job to make a contribution to those goals. And therefore, it's the evaluation's job to determine the quality, the value, and importance of that contribution. You need to keep this perspective on what you can reasonably achieve with a small grant and what your evaluation can do with the limited resources. So everything I've covered so far is really about matching the scope of the evaluation to the scope of the project. I spent a lot of time on this point because it's by far the most important thing you can do. So next we'll go through my other suggestions for keeping costs down, but now I'm going to turn things over to Jason for your questions and comments. Okay, great. Thanks, Lori. Um, so we do have a question uh, from Beth. Uh, and it says, how important is it to cover internal evaluation when you have an exter experienced external evaluator? Um, I think I'm going to talk a little bit more about the role of internal evaluation. I think it just makes a lot of sense to do some of, some of the work uh, inside the project, not only to save costs, but also to build up that capacity within a project team. I mean, it can be, you want to be able to gather and, and use feedback immediately, and it's good if you kind of have someone on the team who's kind of thinking in that way. But I will talk more about internal and external evaluation in the next section. Okay. The next question is, is there a weighting factor to an external evaluation? Um, NSF does not use a point system in reviewing proposals. It's very um, a, a kind of a global global rating system. It's not so you don't get extra points for you know this and that. But extra, an external, and we'll see this in my next section. They do require a, a budget line for an ex, an independent, what they call an independent evaluator. So I think you will get into trouble if you ignore that requirement.
And then finally, uh, can you say more about why you would plan an evaluation around the need a project is addressing rather than its goals? Does an NSF want to know if the project goals were met? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, ideally, you do want close, really, really close alignment, perfect alignment between needs and goals. But sometimes people can really fixating, fixate on writing measurable goals. They worry about really being, con you know, those kind of smart goals that we hear about. And so then they default to things that can be counted. Um, so then what happens is it's just, you know, like, that, like I give the example, like pro providing, our goal is to provide, you know, six webinars a year. So then if you, if that's all you're evaluating around, if you start with a goal-based evaluation, then it's really just to check was it done or not. We met our goal. And that's really not getting at what difference does a project make. Is it, is it advancing technician education? Um, so the problem is not that it's, we don't want to know about goals being met. It's just that goals aren't always well crafted. And that can lead to a shallow evaluation if it only focuses on those kinds of goals. And then we had one other question here. Uh, so who drafts the evaluation questions, the PI or the evaluator? Um, I think the best way to do that is to put a back and forth situation. Um, I don't think, I think the evaluator has to kind of guide the project team to focusing on what matters most in the evaluation, what, where their information needs are, and to craft evaluate important evaluation questions around those. So I wouldn't put it in one camp or another. It's definitely a, a team effort and requires dialogue and negotiation. All right. Well, thank you, Lori. Before we move on, I'd like to turn it over to our survey guy, Corey Smith, for a word from our sponsor. Corey? Hi, everyone. Yesterday, the 2015 AT survey opened. PIs received an email containing a link to their grant survey, and this link can be used by them or shared with project staff if others will be taking some responsibility for completing portions of the survey. This year is the survey's 16th year, so a happy sweet 16 to it. The data collected by the survey is used to report on the activities and accomplishments of ATE projects and centers each year, and we have consistently achieved a response rate of over 90%, so let this year be no different. The survey platform has changed, and there's information about this change on the website. So now, uh, go forth and respond. All right, thanks, Corey. And speaking of surveys, our external evaluator, Dr. Lana Rux, is currently working hard to boost the response rates to a survey she sent out to everyone on Evaluate's contact list. If you did receive a survey request for her, we'd very much appreciate your participation. And now, back to Lori, who will talk about minimizing evaluation costs. Thanks, Jason. Um, and thanks for your questions. So many of you have small projects or have been involved in evaluating small projects. So again, I want to hear from you. What tips or tricks do you have for keeping evaluation costs down? And I would like us to go ahead and use a chat box. Um, and what I'd like to do, get some good ideas, is to pull these out of our uh, webinar transcripts and share these on our Facebook page. So I'm sure you guys have some ideas of your own. Good point. Donna says using existing data when possible. So that takes away one point I need to make. Yeah, Blake is also saying get, get that IR data for sure. Other thoughts? Good planning, definitely. Using existing instruments, yep. Creating a good instrument can be very time consuming. So if you have one that works for you, that is definitely a good idea. Gordon saying using logic models. Yeah, keep everybody focused by using a good logic model. Those are great ideas. So keep them coming. We'll pull them out and share them. Uh, so from day one, you should start tracking who is participating with your project. 
This information can be in a spreadsheet or a database, but anywhere you can quickly obtain descriptive statistics about the type of people involved in your work, as well as the frequency and depth of their involvement. And this isn't just about students. You want to be able to demonstrate engagement and commitment among faculty, staff, external partners, project advisors, um, whoever your, your, you know, your stakeholders are. And I'm going to give you some examples from Evaluate. When we started as a resource center in 2008, our contact list consisted of about 200 ATEPIs. And now we have more than 1,500 people on our contact list. And we know exactly who they are and how frequently they've engaged with us because we've tracked that information from the beginning of their grant. This charts a breakdown of our audience by their role in relation to the ATE program. We expected PIs to be our main audience. But as you can see here, they're actually number three on the list. And it's actually the college administrators who make up the bulk of our audience, more than a third. So raise your hand. Uh, remember how to raise your hand? Do that. If you're a college grant writer, a research officer, if you have any other type of administrative role at a college, that's who we've lumped into this admin group. Can you just raise your hand? So. Wow, yeah, so 22 people already. That's about almost, almost a quarter of the people on this webinar. So that is wonderful. We're thrilled to have you with us. And this is really valuable information for us. On the one hand, it says we need to work harder at attracting ATEPIs and evaluators. But it also tells us that this admin group really needs the kind of information that we provide. So this is a real eye-opener for us because when you kind of think about it, it seems obvious, but it wasn't at first. It's often a grant writer or a college research officer that's, that is a new PI's first source of information about evaluation. So we use this kind of information to demonstrate our broader impacts, as well as to tailor our outreach and content to make sure we're serving the needs of all of our audiences. Another thing we're able to do with our tracking database is to look at the frequency of participation. Here we see that most people come to just one or two of our events. Well, on the one hand, it's great to be able to say we've had direct contact with nearly 900 people through our webinars and workshops, but it's not so great that they're just coming to one or two events. Um, so again, I'd like you to raise your hand. Could you clear the current hand raises? Can someone at Maytech clear their hand raises? Thank you. Um, now I'd like you to raise your hand if you've attended three or more Evaluate webinars that you can remember ever. Numbers are great. Well, as you can see, you're part of an elite group here, and we hope you'll keep coming back. And so these two charts just scratch the surface of what we can do with our participation database. And we also keep track, uh, close track of what organizations we've engaged with. So here are many, not quite all, of the organizations that are represented among our, our collaborators, our contributors, our consultants. Um, so if you see your your organization's logo on the side, I'd like you to use your marker tool and just give it a circle around it. Of course, our friends at Skate, Florence Darlington are represented, and Gordon from Springfield Technical Community College, someone from Berkeley and Sinclair. Wonderful. So a lot of you. And if you've ever worked with one of these organizations, how about you mark those as well? Who have you worked with? Cool. I like this. This is great. So to, to me this shows, and I think to others, it shows that we're not working in isolation and that we have had quite an array of entities working this. And I think this helps our credibility. Now I'm amazed. That is really cool. Thank you for doing that. So the point of these examples is to tell you what, about us. It's to just demonstrate what you might be able to do with very basic participation data from your own projects. I hate to go off this slide. It really makes me happy, but I have to move ahead. So you're going to need information on who's engaging with your project for your NSF annual reports, as well as the this ATE annual survey, which you just heard about from Corey, reporting so much easier when you have quick access to that information. Related to basic documentation is 
maintaining a complete record of your project's activities and accomplishments. We started our project resume because the chair of our National Visiting Committee, Nick Smith, and let me give a shout out to Peggy Weeks who is also on our National Visiting Committee and I think is on the webinar with us. Um, Nick recommended this as a way to update the NVC members on what the project has been doing. And we maintain ours in the web and PDF, uh, a web version and as well as a PDF version on the web. Um, and if you want to check them out, you can certainly do that on, on our website. Basically, it just lists our mission, our goals, our funding, our staffing levels, deliverables, and all of our personnel, including not just our paid staff, but our consultants and collaborators as well. As well. And we're in our seventh year, and this um, resume is up to 14 pages now. It, the point of it, it just puts a lot of the information we need for our annual reports at our fingertips. And it also serves as a public account of what we're doing with our NSF funding. Now we're a sizable project and we've been around for a while, but even a new small project can create a one to two page fact sheet that serves much the same function. Another thing you can do is to keep, you, to keep your evaluation costs down is to take advantage of institutional data. And that's something many of you mentioned in the chat box. Institutional research offices track a lot of data about students and it typically includes their demographics and enrollment information along with the data for determining retention and graduation rates. And you may be able to use the institutional data to create baseline data uh, as well as to track changes over time, maybe even create comparison groups. I strongly recommend that you read Carolyn Brennan's and Russell Cannon's contributions to our uh, latest newsletter as well as a, a recent blog in which they go over in detail the many types of institutional data that there are as well as national level data that you can access and use for evaluation reports as well as grant proposals. They're clearly experts in this area and I will defer to them. You should definitely read those pieces. Finally, you should not leave all the evaluation legwork to your external evaluator. So I'm going to talk about internal and external evaluation, but if I did not fully address the question that was posed earlier, feel free to ask it again and we'll, we'll revisit. Um, so PIs should work with their evaluators to determine which aspects of the evaluation the internal team can take responsibility for. As I mentioned before, all ATE projects must be evaluated and as indicated in this quote um, from the solicitation, they have to include a you know, specific budget line for an independent evaluator. An evaluator doesn't necessarily have to be from a different institution to be independent. An evaluator is independent if he or she doesn't have roles on other roles on the project, isn't supervised by someone on the project, or doesn't have a financial, a direct financial or intellectual stake in the project success. And this photo is of, of me with our external evaluator, Lana Rux. And this was a um, 2011 ATE TI conference. We were at a breakfast round table. I just love this photo because this is actually where we met that, at that round table. And I was just so impressed by what she had to say about evaluation that we quickly became colleagues. And then when we as a project evaluate was faced with the prospect of having to find a new external evaluator, she was at the top of the list. And she certainly met those criteria for being independent. And like us, most ATE projects do use external evaluators, mostly. So in fact, I mean external to the institution. Um, according to ATE PIs, uh, excuse me, the ATE survey, 90% of projects, ATE projects adhere to that requirement to have an evaluator. And most of them are using evaluators that are external both to the project and the institution. So that's pretty much the norm. Uh, just a few projects say that they have internal evaluators, but I'm sure many more projects are doing some of the evaluation legwork internally. And there's different ways to structure the relationship between an external evaluator and the evaluation related work done by project personnel, and I'll speak to that in just a moment. The solicitation also indicates that the funds requested for the evaluation should match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. In other words, NSF is giving a lot of leeway when it comes to budgeting for an evaluation. And that's great, but it can leave a lot of people wondering where to start. 
So the rule of thumb is that 10% of a project's cost should be allocated for evaluation. And that's in general, evaluation in any context. And so that's a good place to start. And then you can go up or down from there depending on what level of evaluation is needed for the project. For small projects, sometimes 10% is just too much. As Jason mentioned at the beginning of the webinar with that first poll, the reality is that current expenditures on evaluation among ATE grantees averages about 8%. And that's an average that includes those small grants that we were talking about today, as well as the multi-million dollar centers. So this is just kind of a, a benchmark for you as you're thinking about evaluation budgets. And regardless of what you spend on external evaluation, it just makes a lot of sense for someone on the project team to to help out with the evaluation in some way. The project staff are typically going to have greater access to the data sources than the external person, for example. And greater access to what the project is doing on a day-to-day -day basis if you do want to create a project resume or keep a tracking spreadsheet. I do talk about these different ways to arrange external and external evaluation responsibilities in our fall 2014 newsletter. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these arrangements. Briefly, um, what I call the external evaluator as coach approach, the internal, the external evaluator provides guidance on evaluation to the internal project team throughout the life of the grant. So that sort of has a capacity building dimension. When the evaluator is what I call the heavy lifter, he or she's going to take the lead in the planning the evaluation, designing instruments, analyzing results, writing reports. So the internal team is mainly going to be helping with gathering data and providing that to the external evaluator. In the external evaluator as architect model, that external person is designing the overall evaluation and developing data collection instruments, and the project team is executing the plan, maybe with technical assistance from the evaluator as needed. And finally, in what I've called the divide and conquer approach, the internal team is responsible for evaluating the project's, um, some aspects of the project's implementation and the, as well as those shorter term outcomes. And the external evaluator handles the assessment of longer term outcomes and those higher stakes evaluation questions. And that's actually what we do here at Evaluate. However you decide to organize an internal and external evaluation responsibilities, they should be complementary, working together toward the common goal of producing those, that high quality, useful evaluation. And note that three of the five strategies we've covered today to keep costs low, three of those five are things that project personnel can and should do. Then the external evaluator can focus on the tasks that require more specialized knowledge of evaluation. Jason and I are working on a project together right now, uh, an NSF project, not ATE, some, another program, where we've spent, it seems like countless, many, many, many hours in trying just to get a handle on who are their students, who aren't their students, who's still around, what are their roles. It's a lot of work, and it's probably twice as hard for us to do because we're not close to the project. So that is definitely something an internal team can do and provide to the evaluator. So I'd like to leave you with one final suggestion. To think of an evaluation as an investment. If that investment is too small, you're probably not going to be able to extract much value from it. If it's too much, it's going to pull resources away from project implementation. But if you strike the right balance, it's going to bring value to your project and everyone's going to be happy. So on that note, I'm going to turn it back over to Jason now to handle our final question break. Okay. Oops. Okay, great. Thanks, Lori. Um, so we have several questions, uh, the first being a follow-up question from Beth. How much should we spend in our NSF proposal on internal versus external evaluation? I know the internal evaluation description should be longer. So the internal evaluation should be about a short paragraph, external evaluation about two or two and a half pages maybe? Um, I would offer, that might be fine, but I, I'll just tell you how I would approach that. I would set, I would describe the evaluation plan in terms of what are the questions we're going to ask, what are the data we're going to use to answer them, how it's going to be analyzed. Then I would, in more, then I would describe how the responsibilities are going to be divided and how, and so in terms of um, 
budgeting, I think it's very hard to put a, a budget percentage on internal evaluation unless you actually have a person's if that's their position title and you know that, you know, 50% of their job is that or whatever, I think it's hard to say exactly a percentage on internal because at least for us it's so integrated into what we do. You know, after this webinar we're going to get a spreadsheet that shows everyone who was at, at this webinar and it folds into our database and just it's part of our, it's part of what we do. So to put a percentage on that would be difficult. Um, but I do think that um, proposal reviewers want to see a very clear well-articulated plan, and part of that is who's responsible for what, and they want to know, and they, they want to know what the external evaluator is going to be responsible for. And you have to, you know, you have a budget line for that in, independent evaluator, and you have a budget justification that has to say what that person's going to contribute for that amount. So that's how I would approach it, not so much in like this this amount, this many paragraphs for this, and and something else for for the external. It should be a cohesive, a cohesive kind of thing. Sorry. Oh, no problem. So the next question is, what skills does someone need to have in order to handle internal evaluation tasks? Well, I think that really depends on what the tasks are. You know, if it's something like creating a spreadsheet and staying on top of that sort of thing, updating a, a resume, um, I think it really just takes someone who's organized and can handle, you know, has basic Excel skills. Um, I think it's great too if there's a person on a team whose job it is to be bringing these sort of evaluative issues up into team meetings and kind of reflecting on, on how things are going and using data as it's coming in. Um, so that doesn't really require specialized knowledge and training and evaluation. But if you're going to be involved in, the more, in other tasks like um, developing questionnaires even, it's so easy to do a bad job on developing uh, survey instruments if you if you haven't had any training in how to do it. Um, analyzing data, it requires some specialized skill. So it really depends on, on the task. And so again, that's something where I would want to sit down with the, the project team and the evaluator and like what needs to happen, who can handle what. Um, if these, these tasks need to be done by the internal team, what does that person need to know how to do and able to do that job well and make sure that it's like if they're collecting data or doing anything like that, that, that those data are going to be, you know, quality and, and, be, and be useful for the evaluation. Okay, great. Uh, Tom wants to know, what are some strategies for engaging evaluators during the grant preparation? Um, that is, a, um, I'll tell you the way it usually goes, but Usually what happens is um, hopefully or sooner rather than later a person proposing realizes they need an external person um, to commit to the evaluation and will engage that person in assisting with developing the evaluation plan. Now the tricky part of that is you can't, you don't have any grant funds to pay that person. So the way we work at the evaluation center is typically, and I, I don't mean evaluate, I mean my home unit, the evaluation center at WMU is we'll say, sure, we'd be happy to help you with that. And, you know, if you get the grant, then, you know, we'll obviously be the evaluator. There are different rules about whether you can actually do that at different colleges. So there's not like a one way to do this. But typically people find someone to work with um, and, and ha engage them in the, the evaluation um, in the proposal development process. But it's a fine balance because you don't want to um, ask too much of that person that you're not paying. So you want to come in with, you know, be prepared to engage them efficiently. Okay. Uh, question for the Mentor Connect folks. What if an in institution has been a sub-award on prior grants? Does that count uh, as being involved in a grant? Uh, Jason, uh, this is Elaine, and uh, no, um, that does not disqualify you from being eligible for the small grants program. In fact, it's good because you will have had some experience. Okay, great. And then out of those that have requested to participate in Mentor Connect training, how many are able to be served? Well, that is sort of a sliding answer. Um, of the applicants for our Mentor Connect cohorts. That's the group that Dennis talked about where we bring them in, we give them a couple of intense face-to-face -face workshops, match them with a mentor, and, and help them throughout the, the grant proposal process. 
Um, each year we have had more applicants than we've had slots. Um, we choose uh, 20 teams each year and um, from the applicants we have been able to choose somewhere between 56 to 71 percent of those who apply. So the, the, uh, the chances of being selected for the cohort are pretty good. But it doesn't stop there. Anyone who applies for a cohort and is not selected uh, has the opportunity for a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, approximately one-hour consultation, uh, typically with uh, Co-PI Dennis uh, Faber, or, or one of our other um, experienced um, people and mentors, um, to talk about their grant idea, talk about how they could be more competitive if they come in to apply for MentorConnect again, or to get some assistance if they would like to apply for a grant um, on their own without uh, without working with the Mentor Tech Connect project. And if you have applied and if you participated in our uh, webinars and activities, um, you become part of our network. And that means that you get invited to webinars like today's webinar. You have access to our online resources and all of those uh, neat opportunities that uh, Dennis outlined earlier. Um, Dennis, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, other than I, I think your comment about sort of you're part of the family. Uh, you start getting involved with us and we uh, treat you as part of the family. So we're more than happy to help. That's uh, what NSF has asked us to do. And it seems to be working very well. So we'd encourage your active connection with Mentor Connect at whatever level makes the most sense for you. Okay, well thank you Elaine, Dennis, and Lori. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today, unless there are any other questions. I saw a nice comment in the chat box about heartily recommend applying to the Mentor Connect for mentoring. Uh, the person's partway through the process and found it extremely helpful so far, um, the being mentored. I'd like to take a moment also to mention that uh, on our blog page there's an opportunity to submit a blog of your own if you feel so compelled. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, from members of the AT community uh, to provide tips and techniques to other members of the AT community as well. Uh, we'd like to thank our presenters for participation in today's webinar. Thank you, Dennis and Elaine, for sharing your wisdom today, and thank you, Lori. And with that, happy evaluating.